Morning team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is the Ukraine War News Update, the first of two, uh, as I try to get around uh, YouTube moderation policies. Um, I, sorry, it's a little bit late today. I Goodness me, yesterday was exhausting. Uh, all my videos, plus a live stream on my other channel, plus writing and plus a load of publishing stuff and watching Andrew Perpetua's live stream at two times speed until one o'clock in the morning so I have enough information in my head so that I can splurge it out to you. Anyway, it just meant I woke up a little bit later today. Massive apologies. Right, uh, I've got a cup of tea though, so it's okay. Uh, let's get on with it. We'll go to where we usually start, which is Ukrainian general staff uh, figures for the Russian losses for the day before. And you'll see quite a downtick in uh, liquidated personnel. So troops lost, uh, Russian uh, troops lost 390. I don't quite know why that is. Uh, we have seen some uh, serious battles going on over the last few days in the Robotna and Staromyorska areas. It may be that, that yesterday was the kind of end of those battles and, and there's sort of clearing up the the settlements and regrouping to some extent and so therefore they're not engaging so much or you know whatever don't know one tank six apvs 11 artillery systems so right uh, up and down those categories we are seeing lower numbers no cruise missiles uh, no drones so the russians themselves have been quite quiet uh seven vehicles and fuel tanks and one piece of special equipment that's definitely one of the quietest days i have seen for a long time which is why this uh, you know, um, group of tabs has uh, fewer tabs in it. Uh, however, the Russians are starting to do what you'd expect them to do, which is taking their successes and then putting it out there and showing them from different angles. So, hey, look, uh, we're at the post the same video from a different angle every single day stage of the Ukrainian attack. So this is referring to that attack on Robotna where the Ukrainians lost a number of BMP-1. So these are older Soviet era infantry fighting vehicles. Now, I just want to talk about this a little bit. There, there was, if you're pro-Ukrainian, your initial reaction to Ukrainians losing large amounts of kit and personnel will be, how can that not be the case? So it's really easy for us to think up scenarios whereby, yeah, maybe they weren't full of people, or maybe this didn't happen, or maybe that happened. The reality, as far as I can work it out, is that the Ukrainians did lose those those uh, infantry fighting vehicles. They did lose a lot of troops, and it was a disaster, right? So it was not a good moment. Now, some of the theories coming out about those that particular loss was uh, there, there's a rumor that actually the Ukrainian and this kind of makes sense actually when you look at the video of those fighting vehicles coming in without smoke just driving in and getting hammered by ATGMs on both sides. And ATGMs are a problem in these trenches. The Russians do have anti-tank guided missiles. They do have RPGs that can, you know, hammer all of these vehicles. And they had mines and they had small arms fire and they had artillery. What kind of explains driving in and just basically looking like you're sacrificing yourself to the Russians? Well, actually, as I said, one prevailing rumor is that the Ukrainians were under the impression that they controlled those trenches. And there was some there's a lot of accusations of miscommunication going on from what happened there. And a, a lot of uh, there's another rumor that um, there are too many cooks, too many cooks spoil the broth, and there were too many commanders operating, uh, you know, trying to have their say, and all kind of didn't. It was just a bit of a disaster, and a, a lot of though there were a lot of troops that were lost, and a lot of equipment that was lost. Luckily, it wasn't like the best equipment, um, but nonetheless, it's just it's still bad. I mean, the human lives lost is is terrible. So th I think there will be some fallout from that. There will be some learning, but I don't think we should be trying to paint that in the best possible light just to make ourselves feel better about ourselves is going to be the natural thing that we're going to do. I just think that was, and you're going to see more examples of this where bad decisions are made and things go wrong. And unfortunately, like if you and I do that on a daily basis, we, oh, I made a bad decision at work today. And, you know, it turns out that all oh, that paperwork I've got to redo. And you're like, oh, you're a bit of an idiot. Oh, well. If you make a bad decision at work and you're a commander in a in a war zone, people die, right? And that is about as bad as it can get, right? Sending 
a number of people to their certain death uh, based on a cock up. And, you know, it is about learning from those situations. So anyway, uh, if you if you want, Andrew Perpetua's live stream last night talked about uh, that, they, they, you know, these people have contacts on the line and they are on the ground and they have some idea about what's going on. And of course, they still say, take it with a pinch of salt. But it appears that, yeah, it, it was not good. So in fact, both attacks in the Robotnet area kind of going south and going, kind of going south east were you know they they had they had trouble with them so the robotna area although they're making gains it is coming at a cost but anyway uh we'll come to that later so uh, this is so we're still on the kind of hits and losses this is a strike or not a strike it's an, a partisan uh, bit of activity in the Cossack Bay area of Crimea. Difficult to see much on the shaky video, but saboteurs hit an ammo depot in occupied Crimea. This happened around 10 p.m. last night where Russia's 810th Marine Infantry Brigade is based. We can see one of the many emergency vehicles locals reported arriving. So this might well have been quite a significant hit. There were emergency vehicles, quite a lot of them, and uh, different reports, but it's not a lot of information, however, has come out from there. Uh, it's interesting that... Partisans are doing things in certain places on Crimea, and I think that's because there are still possibly areas that are out of range of Storm Shadow missiles right on the southern edges of Crimea. And I have been wondering about Storm Shadows. So a couple of, uh, about a week ago, wasn't it? Russia absolutely loaded one area, probably less than a week now, uh, actually, to be honest, uh, in, in Ukraine. That is the site of the Su-24M bombers that carried the Storm Shadow missiles, and they hit it with Kinjal, and they hit it with loads of different types of cruise missiles. And there were claims that Ukraine intercepted something like 84.4% of the cruise missiles that were that were thrown at them in that event. But uh, obviously a number got through, and a number of Kinjal got through, and a number of the Iskander K got through. And... I think they were flooding that airport and I've not really seen many storm shadow hits since then. And I have been wondering whether actually they, they, the Russians did have some success against the Ukrainians at that airfield in, uh, in, you know, in halting the flow of storm shadow missiles as they are, you know, being used to strike targets in, uh, in occupied Ukraine. We'll come on to that in a second. Uh, hits and losses still, though. Russia, an employee blew up uh, the Kuybyshev oil refinery in Samara today. So there was, I didn't report it yesterday because there was no footage. And I was just like, yeah, I hear that an oil refinery has been hit in Samara. Preliminary, the improvised explosive device was planted by this, this person who arrived with a bag but was the last person to leave the area without it. Sergei was reportedly born in Ukraine. Uh, yeah, I, not too much detail on that, but an oil refinery in Russia uh, may well be a little worse for wear as a result of uh, sabotage. Here, I'm going to show you this because this is a GRAD, a BM-21 GRAD. So this is a multiple launch rocket system. And this is a result of being hit by cluster munitions. So just have a look at this. You'll see on the uh, bonnet, there's a big hole. And, uh, yeah, holes all around. So cluster munitions are useful tools to use against uh, Russian equipment, not just uh, troops. And obviously bits of shrapnel will fly everywhere. Uh, even the ones that, that miss will hit the ground and throw up stones and bits of rock and stuff, and that will shred uh, the vehicle in, in many ways. So cluster munitions, this is why they are useful uh, for striking not just troops but equipment um and uh the, there is a greater chance of being able to dis disable a piece of equipment with cluster munition than a single uh explosion if you if you miss particularly if it's a not a precision guided munition and you're having to walk uh, uh the munition in you can you could take 10 shells to try and hit something like this whereas a cluster munition hitting nearby We'll, uh, we'll have greater success. So that that is that. We're going to move on to 
distance strikes now and whatnot. Here we have explosions yesterday in Taganrog in Rostov Oblast. So just to let you know where Taganrog is, here we have Ukraine. Here we have the Sea of Azov. And uh, you've got Taganrog here near Rostov on Don. So this is where the uh, Wagnerites and their mutiny, this is where they aimed for first because Gerasimov was supposedly there and they were aiming to capture him. Anyway, Taganrog is in between the Ukrainian border, in between Mariupol, really, and Rostov. So what has happened? Well, there was an explosion in Tag and Rog, uh, smoke went up, etc., etc. usual kind of thing. Yes, I am quite a bit of uh, footage of that from a distance. And then the Russian MED came out and said they blamed Kiev for the explosion in Tag and Rog, claiming the Ukrainians fired a converted S-200 surface-to-air missile. According to Moscow, the missile was intercepted by Russian uh, defences and the wreckage fell to the city of Taganrog. So that's what the Russians say. And, you know, sometimes, well, it could be that the Russians are correct here and that they're not trying to give uh, misinformation or disinformation. Well, it turns out they are giving disinformation because footage came out of the actual strike here and it's not the wreckage of a missile hitting uh, the ground. It's not intercepted unless you want to say it's been intercepted by the ground. Here we clearly see the missile coming down and hitting. Well, the question is, what did it hit? What was it? What what was the target here? Because I I don't know whether that's a direct hit. Is is that is that the building they wanted to hit? Is it behind there? Is it around or is it five hundred meters away? You know, you, you again. This is this is a uh, civilian area. This is a city. So you know, is that the right weapon in the same way that we would say that with the, with the Russians? Is that the right weapon to be using? Uh, what's its circle error probable? Or is, did that actually hit it, its target? Uh, whatever the case is, the Russians are lying about it, um, which is not unusual. At least five people have been injured. Uh, uh, this is yesterday, 10 to 20 local time in a Russian strike on the city of Dnipro uh, that damaged a high-rise apartment and the SBU headquarters. SBU being the security service of Ukraine. So they did actually hit the headquarters of the SBU there. Whether the SBU would actually be working uh, in those buildings, like it's a pretty obvious target. You'd be like, this is our office park and we're the security service. I wonder where you're going to be aiming. So I don't know. But... Nonetheless, there were strikes in Dnipro and uh, Zaporizhia, uh, but it seems like predominantly uh, the strikes have taken out residential areas in uh, Dnipro, as we can see from a lot of footage that has come out. I'll turn the sound off for that. You don't need to hear the hoses and whatnot. Um, but that is the uh, the building that's taken uh, taken quite a hit there. Indeed, uh, there's more footage coming out today of that building. You can see. Yeah, yet again, sort of it appears residential buildings are a main source of target for the Russians. Uh, Russian channels report another attack on the Chonhar Bridge early this morning. So this is going back to the Storm Shadows. So that will likely be Storm Shadows, but not not definitely. As you've seen, there's probably an S-200. I think that looked like an S-200 missile being used there. Uh, but this gives me hope that you know Storm Shadows haven't been uh, taken out in that attack on the airfield. But nonetheless, Russian channels report another attack on the Chonhar Bridge early this morning, which connects Crimea with the Kherson region. I said yesterday that watch out for the bridge at Henichesk, since, you know, that should, I imagine it will be here at some point, given that the Russians have closed off the Arabat Spit and are, so we go and have a look on this map. So the Arabat Spit is that spit coming down there. They've closed that off to the public. So I think they're going to be using that as some kind of... Uh, logistics route coming from this area of Crimea going up there and then feeding to Crimea so the bridge there at Henny Chess you can imagine or the several bridges there are going to be hit that's uh, I'm certain about that and then Chonhar Bridge which I reported to you previously uh, that was hit uh, and and indeed the railway bridge I think here was hit as well so yeah that's been hit overnight and that will cause further headaches for the Russians for sure.
Um, okay, what else do we have here? Russian is running down its missile stockpiles. The most recent arrivals were built in the second quarter of 2023. In other words, they've just been built. Uh, but the high rate of use shows the Russians have stepped up production. Uh, they appear to be prioritizing the air launch KH-101. Now, I have Russian trolls going, oh, they're, used, they're firing missiles. They're not running out. You don't know what you're talking about. You've been saying they've been running out for like six months. <sighs> Right. Okay. Understand what I mean by running out. It doesn't mean they have zero and they will never have any ever again. That's not running out. That's run out and no ability to make new ones. I've never said that. So stop being an idiot. Right. What I am saying is that they are running out in the same way that I've got. I started this year with 100 jam pots in my cupboard. Right. And uh, I've got down to five jam pots, but I make two jam pots a week. I'm running out compared to where I was then, and that's going to affect my usage of my eating of jam, right? I'm not going to eat as many jam sandwiches as I used to eat because I've only got five pots left and I don't make that many a week. That is running out. That's what's happening with the missiles. So if we look at like missile strikes, uh, this is Dell's spreadsheet, his Excel spreadsheet, his uh, superb contribution. Now, now this is... Not quite the data I would like, though. This is intercepted missiles, not missiles fired. So at the beginning of the war, loads of missiles are fired, but the Ukrainians didn't have the air defense systems to take them out. So actually, loads of missiles are fired. This is the interception rate. But what you can tell from this is there are big gaps between firing. They're not firing them all the time. And you can also see that when they were firing like 120 missiles at this point in the war, that didn't happen again. They're not doing that. Why are they not firing that many missiles? If surely it would be advantageous, if they want to blow up stuff and they're continuing to try and blow up stuff, it would be more advantageous to fire more missiles at any one point to blow up it, to blow up that stuff you're trying to blow up. It's not like they've stopped trying to blow up stuff. Like they've done it, like, oh, brilliant, we're, we're finished. They still had those needs, right? So why are they firing fewer and fewer? Like those needs haven't got... Less and less. They're not like, oh, I suppose we'd better fire some missile. You don't really need to. They still want to do that. So the only explanation that makes sense of their change in patterns of firing and they're firing fewer missiles and the different types of missiles they're firing is that they are running out. That's what it they're just they have fewer than they used to to a to a degree that affects their usage of that, right? If I'm running low on fuel in my car, I will use my car less until I get to a petrol station, until I can, you know, arrange a, uh, to, to, to drive to a petrol station. It's just it affects my behavior. Their missile behavior has been affected because they are running low. Right. That's what running out means. But they still produce them on a monthly basis. And indeed, they've upped their production, possibly. But they are. That means they are using them at the rate they are producing them they because their stockpiles have run low and they have to have strategic um stockpiles in case they're involved in an in a in a war with nato or war with anyone else if they're suddenly involved in a war with someone else they don't have the missiles to execute any meaningful offense let alone defense right the these stocks, supposedly, as according to the Ukrainians, 71 of 950 X101 555s or KH101 KH555s. 95 Iskander M's of 800. What they do have a lot of are Kinjals and Onyx, which are Onyx are anti ship missiles, not very accurate for firing at ground targets, but they they very hard to shoot down. Kinjal hypersonic, very hard to shoot down. You need Patriot systems. So you're starting to see them use these more. Why are you starting to see them use those more? Why didn't they use them at the beginning of the war? So they didn't need to use them because they weren't the right type of missile. So why are they using now, particularly the Onyx? Because they don't have a choice because they're running out of the other missiles. Okay, now I understand. So they are running out, but they're still going to be using them. It's not like, oh my goodness, turns out there's nothing in the cupboard. They've got stuff in the cupboard, but they need to keep stuff behind and they're not producing it at rates that, that can sustain the kind of attacks that we saw in the at the peak of their missile usage. It's just, it's obvious. Don't be willfully ignorant. Uh, or disingenuous. Like, if you're going to comment on my threads, like, don't be an idiot. Um, Russian trolls. Right, moving on to other bits and pieces. Sorry, it's getting ranty. Uh, Ukraine has used North Korean artillery shells. I wonder why. Oh, it's because they're running out of shells. <laughs> Same problem. 
perspective and category. Uh, Ukraine, so that's not Ukraine, that's Russia, by the way, running out of shells. Uh, now, Ukraine has, has used North Korean artillery shells that they've captured. Uh, likely these are captured Russian shells from the Bakhmut area, judging by the markings they're manufactured in the 80s and 90s. We see Shoigu over in North Korea in the last couple of days. Why? Why is he suddenly going to North Korea? Because they need a load of ammunition. Ah, oh, right, okay. Ukrainian soldiers said these shells are of bad quality. Um, and actually, there is talk. I saw another another tweet. I, I want to look into the uh, the provenance of it, but talking about what they're wanting off North Korea. So it, it seems that they really do actually need stuff off North Korea. And, you know, obviously, that's why he went and visited North Korea. And the sorts of things they want appear to be everything. Um, right. Just get, because I, I love to... Uh, I can't go a week without talking about Elon Musk. So I know loads of you love him. I know loads of people on the right love him. I get involved in looking at Twitter feeds of, of people who have him as an idol. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I need to stay away from that. It's not good for my health. Uh, why I'm mentioning him, it's interesting that some of my sources are clearly not lefty liberals like me. People like Defmon, uh, people like Trent Talenko, who loves to have a pop at, at the Biden administration. They all hate what Elon Musk is doing to Twitter or what X. Um, but it's just quite funny. There's a few things like he was, wants to change it, the name to X, and it's uh, it's been banned in Indonesia, which is one of his biggest. Indonesia is one of his biggest Twitter um, uh, marketplaces, uh, ironically, and it's because of the name X. Uh, and also, you can't have an Apple Twitter um, Apple app with only one letter in the name. So you just can't have it. So you can't have the name X in, uh, you can change the icon, but on Apple devices, it has to be called Twitter still. So I just think that's quite funny. Anyway, why am I mentioning Elon Musk? Because he's got together with Vivek Ramaswamy, who is running for US president, but is basically a Russian appeaser. And a chat also with David Sachs, who is a Russian appeaser. And they've got together and had a, a live chat right, or a chat about this and put it out on Twitter. Now, it's really important when you're talking about what people like this think because they have huge influence online, right, especially Elon Musk. He's just massive. He owns Twitter or he owns X. He has massive reach. So when he gets together and has a big talk about what we should do with Ukraine and, and starts off by saying, look, we're not appeasers, and then promptly gives an account of how Ukraine should give up everything and appease Russia, then they are appeasers. And those three people have a reach that's massive and are telling all those people these things. And those people go away and then they speak to their relatives and friends around a water cooler or at home or at the dinner table and so on and so forth. And this spreads. And this is it's just not good enough. So, so what uh, just, you know, oh my gosh, the analogy of aiming... Uh, arming the Mujahideen in Afghanistan while discussing the US military aid for Ukraine was awful. Now they're discussing Elon's so-called peace proposal on Ukraine. Zero expertise on the topic, but a lot of horrible ideas. They were so damn accurate and compelling right up until they started talking about Ukraine. David Sachs is just plain pro-Russian, and the other two have been seriously deluded by him. Uh, and just the, they advocate a, for a peace deal that consists of giving Russia everything they want and ignoring everything Ukraine wants. Uh, and they cry that people call them appeasers when that's exactly what they are. Uh, they think that supporting Ukraine can only end badly. Uh, and and yeah, the claims are just yeah it's dangerous don't do it oh. mm. right the, a rumor be careful but there's rumor of the 70th motorized rifle brigade uh being in mutiny and they're near the front line uh at nova Pokrivka. this is robotnik area uh, so that is uh um, that's Nova Pokrovka up there, not Nova Pokrovka. That's Nova Pokrovka. Anyway, something like that. That's in that area. That's where they're operating. Might not be true, but, you know, worth bearing in mind. Uh, now, there's been this kind of change in the way that the Ukrainians have been doing their uh, attacks, I guess. This is from The Times, but Shashank Joshi from The Economist is, is quoting it. It's hard graft by... 
only the most motivated soldiers. Expensive Western supplied armor would be too vulnerable in the narrow streets. So when you go into these sort of little um, urban areas or not even, you know, settlements, then actually you don't want to be waltzing in there with your uh, with your newly supplied Leopard 2 tanks. Expensive Western supplied armor would be too vulnerable in the narrow streets. So after smashing it with artillery, the capture of each village has become a bruising firefight, infantry on infantry. They let us approach as close as 20 meters before shooting. Ole says, they got smarter and we knocked them out in Neskuchina. So Neskuchina is just south of Velika Novosilka, Vremivka area before you know you get down the uh, Makarivka and then down to Staromyorsky where they are at the moment but they were saying that that when they're at the beginning of the counteroffensive uh, and they knocked the Russians out of Neskuchina really quickly and the simple head-on approach does not fly anymore so they got smarter after that uh, and then uh, it's interesting it refers to a, a chaplain turned suicide drone pilot who said that his profession had been a game changer in a battle. So yeah, the uh, these uh, loiter munitions are are really important, obviously. Uh, the Ukrainian defense forces have taken measures to protect the port infrastructure, but the military does not rule out new attacks by Russia, says uh, um, Natalia Humenyuk from the Southern Operational Command. Quote, we hope that measures taken will be quite effective, but observing that the enemy has taken a certain pause, it is possible to conclude that they are preparing for the next attacks behind perhaps a new tactic. There's been a call for huge amounts of air defence systems. They, there was talk about that really Ukraine need 10 to 12 Patriot batteries around you, And they do, of course they do. If Russia are going to be sending... Because whenever there's a gap... Russia will exploit that and, uh, you know, gap in air defences like Odessa and send their Kinjals and Onyx that can only be taken out by your very best systems. So then you get your very best systems in, in place there and then they go and move somewhere else and it's just moving around finding the gaps uh, and hitting them with missiles. So they need to plug those gaps, the Ukrainians. They need air defence systems that cover the entirety of Ukraine. And uh, that sounds like, oh, we want the best and we want lots of it. But of course they do. They're defending their nation. And uh, imagine living in a place that's getting hit by Kinjal missiles. Yeah, you would want everything and you want it now. So that that's where they're at. They are getting air defense systems, but these things take time. And in the time it takes, Russia are able to hit with the missiles that they are using. Anyway, uh, that's the first part of my news piece done today. Uh, check out part two that's going to follow shortly. Uh, speak soon.